Hi, I'm Tim Anderson. I'm programming coordinator here at the 29th Annual Florida Film Festival and welcome to the Q&A program for shorts block number three. Uh, I'm excited to welcome our filmmakers here. Uh, we played yesterday in the NZN Theater and uh, the films are still available on demand uh, through Eventive. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, we've got a great uh, selection of the filmmakers here with us as well. I'd love to start by introducing them and they can tell you all a little bit about their film. Uh, so let me start with uh, Jen LaFleur. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer LaFleur and uh, my film is Baby Kate. I wrote it and directed it and produced and acted in it. Um, and we, you know, I just, I, I am primarily an actor, but I really wanted to start to get into directing and have been wanting to try my, my hand at that for a long time. And I had a dream that kind of spawned the idea for, for the short film um, about a friend who, one of my best friends has two kids, but in my dream, there was a third child there that I was having a conversation with. And it was very vivid and very um, prominent when I, when I woke up, I still really remembered every detail. And I was telling her about it and, um, she kind of helped me remember that if she hadn't had a miscarriage six years previous, she would have had a six-year-old boy, which was about the age of, of the little boy in the dream. And I started thinking a lot about that and about how um, if you have gone through the loss of a child, whether it's through miscarriage or through the loss of a child that's already been born, I just started to think about how people might um, handle that in different ways and deal with that in different ways. And so that's where the idea kind of spawned from. And at the same time, uh, I had been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years and was not so successful at it. Uh, and was obviously kind of working through a lot of my own stuff at the same time. So we shot the film in one day at my house, which you can probably tell from. And, um, and then on the about when we wrapped the film, like completely picture locked, finished the whole thing about two weeks later, I got pregnant. And then, and then this, this person arrived about six weeks <laughs> out. <laughs> You're going to be the only one who gets to bring a baby to like the Q&A for probably the whole I know. Festival. It's perfect. So, um, <laughs> our Florida Film Festival alumni would recognize Jennifer from like a lot of films that have been here at the festival. Probably uh, Bobby Pook is mad. Um, yeah, you know, we're so phenomenal. Film. I love that we movie. Love, we love Bobby, so yeah, I'm excited to get to play this one as well. Um, let's move over to some other returning alumni. This is an alumni stacked program, actually, as well. Um, it's Matthew and Juliana. Welcome back. Hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Bonifacio, and uh, I directed, co wrote, and produced Master Maggie along with. I'm Juliana Galinas Bonifacio, and I co wrote and produced. Master Maggie. And uh, the inspiration for Master Maggie, um, I'm a private acting coach in, in real life and I was always interested in telling a story, long or short, uh, about a private celebrity acting coach. And uh, I was fascinated with this one-on-one -on -one human connection. And Juliana, who's produced 10 years of our films, has also been getting into writing and directing. Um, and we wanted to collaborate uh, as writers on something as well. And I pitched her, you know, some some ideas with it, and she's like, "It's missing something," and um, she basically came up with the twist and other things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we sat down that night and wrote it yeah. nice. together. So and the rest is is history. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the masked man below, Alex. Hello. Um, just want to say, wow, what a fun block. And it's uh, so great to be with you guys here live on Sunday, August 16th. Um, it's been a really weird year, but like, I don't think any of us saw what happened, saw it coming, like what happened the first two weeks of August. It was really wild. So I think like, <laughs> cool that we're all here today. Um, uh, I made a short called Earache. Um, uh, what was the question? Uh, to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Alex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is uh, my, my third time here in yeah. Florida um, and the year I was ready to fly out and attend. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> what else? 
That's it. All right, great. <laughs> I come back. So Alex, um, the, Alex's last film was here just last year. Those of you who saw it, uh, Squirrel, it's arguably, arguably one of the most awkward films that we've played in the festival in a long time. And ironically, the film that's most awkward probably prior to that is made by the next person in this Q&A. Uh, and that is Jesse, uh, who has previously had Meet My Rapist at the festival, a film which caused a lot of people to ask me a lot of questions I was not comfortable answering. <laughs> so a Jesse, white man is exactly who I want to speak for me, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> I did um, a terrible job. You shouldn't. <laughs> no, I'm really happy to be back. You guys like supported uh, rape comedy before it was cool, and I'm I'm honored to be back again. And um, I have a short. It's called He's the One. And it looks at um, what happened. Um, so like Me Too happened and everything with Harvey Weinstein and everyone was like, oh my God, it's so good. Like the asshole is going to jail. And with my own experience with sexual assault, I was like, okay, well that's, there are people that like belong in jail forever, but what about everybody else? And having this, yeah. seeing what was happening with Me Too, which was also, it was amazing, but there was also this thing with, where like guys were over here, girls were over here. Everybody was afraid of getting in trouble. Nobody really wanted to talk honestly about it, um, about consent and sexuality and how do you forgive somebody that hurt you? Is it possible for a good person to do a horrible thing? Yeah. So I wrote He's the One as a feature and um, was having a lot of trouble getting financing for it because, um, yeah, people are just yeah. like, <laughs> rape is not funny. And, uh, and so, yeah, I decided to shoot the short version of it and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be back. We're really excited to show this and I actually don't think it will cause quite as many, uh, weird comments to at least me on the way as people get on the way out of the theater. But, uh, you know, I always appreciated, uh, both of the films have an incredibly distinctive voice. Uh, about them and they obviously tackle pretty serious hot button issues but they do it in a way that is decidedly lighthearted. but that's not really the point um the sub story you know what's going on beneath the surface there is a way to address that and uh, you know comedy is something that you can pull that off in but it takes it's, it's such a fine line to be able to really make people think but do it in a way that's very funny um nicole your your film is just about a an amazing love affair. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it's a metaphor for my dating life in Los Angeles. Uh, lots of unrequited situations. But no, first of all, everyone's story is incredible. I, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. And I made a film called Thirsty about a mosquito that falls in love with a man after she tastes his blood and uh, shot in part from her point of view, from the female gaze, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was sort of born from a friend's idea about a mosquito who turns into a woman after she tastes his blood. And I thought it would be more interesting to bring him to her level and turn him yeah. into a mosquito, which is, um, yeah, the story we ended up making. It's a, a Little Mermaid-esque fairy tale. Well, you should know, and I imagine the audience agrees, that there are many women and men I know that would be very excited about falling in love with Jay Ellis if they had uh, any parts of his body. All president of that fan club. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So, um, yeah, casting for the win. We got that one. <laughs> yeah, proud. Um, all right, well, uh, let me, I, you guys all have addressed it a little bit along the way, um, but maybe, and um, maybe I'll start back with you, Nicole, and work backwards, to because uh, Jennifer always kind of covered this a little bit, but kind of the key question I would like to start out with is, you know, a little bit of the genesis of the project, you know, why you wanted to tell this exact story, um, and then, um, like, I'd like to let you guys kind of have at each other for a few minutes. Sure. I mean, I, my goal was to make a, a, a love story in an unusual love story, a love story in an extreme kind of circumstance, which is, which is a 
target I like to hit for a lot of the stuff that I write. And when we, when my friend told me about this mosquito story, like mosquitoes are such interesting insects. You know, when, when a mosquito finds its mate, they, they start to buzz at the same frequency when they find each other. And there was just so much interesting stuff to play with on that side of things, but also it was a real opportunity, I thought, to cast diverse and show yeah. a young, younger black man, A, being the damsel in distress, B, being, you know, I got a lot of responses from, from black men saying like, wow, it was really cool to see a black man objectified yeah. and made to look beautiful and lit well and, and, and all these things that I guess I was thinking about on a very secondary level but on a, on a very primary level of seeing black men seek se sexual health care and sort of weaving these more um, contemporary issues into this kind of fun love story. That's awesome. Um, and so I wrote the script actually for Maya and for Jay, and I was very lucky that I was able to work with them and, I wrote on a show called Big Mouth, which is how I met Maya and sort of was aware of her tremendous, tremendous voice acting skills. And Jay is, you know, plays a very vulnerable, you know, hot man on Insecure. And we love that about him. And I was, I, I felt very lucky that I got to, he got to embody a character that was, you know, complex and emotional and I I um yeah that's sort of I was very lucky I, I sent it to them they said yes Maya was like I'm your mosquito and <laughs> and we I pitched it you know it's it's very hard as we all know to get money to make short films unless you're self-financing or have the privilege to self-finance which I do not and FX has this program called cake where they make a bunch of weird stuff and fun, funky stuff. And I brought it to them and they greenlit it. So it was, I got very lucky. They were the, the very last on a list, long list of people I asked to make this strange movie. And it's the kind of movie that most people say, well, why don't you just make something animated? Yeah. Hmm. Then beyond that, it's, people can't imagine it. They couldn't imagine it when I pitched it. I could have very well done a bad job pitching, but it, it it's a peculiar story. So I felt very lucky they got it. Yeah, we watched, um, I'm on the selection committee for the competition shorts, a part of the team that actually selected the movies. And it's definitely one where when we talked about it amongst ourselves, we asked each other, you know, like it's so rare to find a short film that's unique um, that uh, tackles a topic in a completely different manner. Um, and it's very rare to see something that you haven't seen before, um, especially in shorts. Like I always tell everybody, no matter how weird your story is, you're telling me, like not only have I seen it before, I like watched it yesterday mm. like, in somebody else's short. And this was definitely one of those ones where we thought, well, wow, would the audience go on this very strange trip? you know, around this. And I think that you, there's a lot of elements that exist inside of the way that you've told the tale. Um, and of course, that it has a phenomenal ending moment um, that really just hammers the short home um, and made it kind of a home run. So we're Thank very you. excited to be you. featuring it. Um, Jesse, I know you've touched a little bit on, about this as well um, on yours, but, um, and I guess maybe, uh, Maybe my question to you is a little bit broader, uh, since you've had two films that both kind of address um, the subject of sexual assault uh, from a more, not necessarily whimsical standpoint, but certainly from an way that sort of requires your audience to identify, to be able to sort of make their peace with what they're watching um, and sort of how, how you approach that. Um, yeah, as far as like tone, um, kind of to echo what Nicole was saying about her fucking brilliant film, which I cannot stop thinking about, which is like a Buddhist rom-com. It's so <laughs> fucking deep. 
I can handle how good that film is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the question of like, I know it, I, in my bones, you know, it comes from a personal place and then you write and then you work on it and then you go to the labs and then you get notes and then you're rewriting, rewriting. And you're like, this tone is so in my bones. Like I don't set out to make sexual assault and then make a comedy. It's yeah. just the tone of my life and how I experience the world. And the only way, quite frankly, that I would want to watch the subject, like I don't, I don't watch, uh, I don't like watching like trauma. Yeah. Um, and I think with the tone, it was really, I, I was pissed at the time that I couldn't get financing for the feature. Um, Cause I was like, I've already done this before and I've already showed you guys, you know, like my ego kicked in and I was just like, I made bulimia funny. I've made sexual assault funny. Like I can do this. And I think it was really having to look at um, like, I actually didn't know if I could pull it off. I knew what I was trying to say, but like once you have all the elements of the actors and the way you shoot it and like the music, like was it actually going to work? And the, this movie like really scared me. It really freaked me out because I knew like the thing of having compassion for somebody that hurt you and seeing like your rapist as human and in the car, like, my train of thought was just like, could I really forgive this person? Could I see this person as human? Could I have love for this person? Could I, oh my God, what if I fell in love with him? Like, that was the, like, panic attack yeah. dream of this movie. And it really freaked me out. And I've, I've worked on the script, the feature for years. And, I, like, something would happen, like, Trump would say some crazy shit. I'm like, oh my God, am I like making like a pro? Like <laughs> it was like really yeah. fucking freaky and like who needs this story? And, but there was just something inside of me that was just like, I know that this truth, like this really means something to me. Yeah. This is like my values and comedy is like really like sacred the way that it can make you confront shit. And that's, it's been like essential in my own process. And like, oh my God, bitch, are you so desperate that you're gonna date your rapist? Like, are you fucking kidding? Like, to me, like, yeah, that was just really important. So I'm, I, I, I'm glad that I made the short because yeah, my ego was like, yeah, of course you can do it. And then like actually having to direct it is very different. Writing and directing are very different. And like putting on my director's hat and being like, okay, how am I gonna, how am I gonna give this note? How am I gonna, how long am I gonna, where am I gonna cut? Like what cue am I gonna yeah. choose? Like, can I actually do this tone? And I feel like shorts give you the confidence to really like answer that question. Yeah. So I feel grateful for the whole process, even though it was really fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing short. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. Comedy is the thing that you can use to kind of like, force people to confront the thing they don't want to confront so alex so earache is i mean it really is a departure from from your last film squirrel which did it, it existed to essentially be uh, uncomfortable uh, but this is a really interesting film and it's a really kind of like it's a touching film it's a it's a film about a guy who's really struggling um, and I'm just, yeah, I'm very curious about, um, this is a, actually a big tonal departure, I think, from your last film. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say, uh, like Jesse, my short is very pro-Trump, extremely pro-Trump. <laughs> make it very clear to everyone. Um, and, but no, actually, that was a very uh, uh, specific, like, so I was shooting Squirrel, and uh, not that I have a career right now, but uh, anything that even slightly resembles part of a career is now all due to Squirrel. And at the time it was just, I don't know, I was just like making a short with friends over the weekend. Yeah. So when, after that, after we shot it, um, I was like, okay, that was fun, but what, a, okay, that was a big waste of time. Okay, let me get real now. And let me make an actual short. Let me, uh, and I was like, let me try to do just the exact opposite of anything Squirrel yeah. related. So it'd be, uh, Visually, casting-wise, um, and tonally, I was like, well, let's just do a different thing. And the big one was, you know, Squirrel is just a very clear, uh, here is a, a comedy premise, let me play it out. And this was like, okay, no premise, character piece. And uh, I think I was just kind of looking at myself and people around me, and like, I think the thing that uh, just seemed the most sensitive to me was, uh, self-pity that was going around and i'm guilty of it too and i think a lot of people especially in the 
in the entertainment LA field, like really pity themselves and stuff. And uh, so I just wanted to explore that and give a guy who has some actual pain, but also, uh, you know, he's at fault. And just, yeah. Uh, see where that goes. I mean, he's a very interesting character because if you think about somebody who's basically in extreme pain to a degree all the time, I mean, everything around you basically is rattling on your last nerve. So, yeah, I, I, it, it's a great film. I mean, obviously, all, all of you guys' films, and I'm going to say this too much, and it's going to sound just like insincere, but this is hard, arguably the best series of short programs put together this year in this festival that I've ever been a part of. Um, and you guys are a big part of that. This block. I mean, that's obvious. Massive. I mean, we all knew that. Yeah. I mean, well, yes, obvious, clearly. So, um, Matthew and Juliana, um, this short's phenomenal. It's a it's a towering piece for performance. Um, and I guess, again, I, I do want to know the genesis of the project, but I think uh, I, I think everyone wants to know a little bit about. Um, Lorraine and Brian's performances in the film, um, as well as your uh, other lead, um, who has the, well, it's a twist, but I, theoretically everybody's seen the twist, so, uh, but I tell you that I, I yeah. rarely does a twist throw me, and it is not what I think it's going to play out to be, and you, you won. Like, I had, did not see that coming. <laughs> Great. Um, so we had, like all of us, we have other projects, um, some before, you know, the particular one that you wind up making. And we had financing for that other film and some of the cast members booked really big jobs and absolutely they have to take them. And our financer was like, well, what else do you have? And we actually had this project. Um, so we moved forward with it and we cast um, the unknown actor first. Uh, Neil Jane, and we thought he would really contrast someone like Lorraine Bracco, if she even read the script and accepted to do it. Um, and, you know, we didn't want someone recognizable in his role, although yeah. he has experience and he's done TV and other work. Um, and then we went after Lorraine, you know, reached out to her reps, um, got the assistant to read the script, then got the managers to read the script, then they got it to Lorraine, she eventually read it, and they wanted to see past work. Um, actually, one of the pieces of, of, of our work that they saw was Fortune House. Oh, nice. We played at Florida. Yeah. And they yep. were like, if you, could, if you could make this as good as Fortune House, um, we're all in. And we're like, that's, that's what we hope to do. Um, and uh, then they wanted a meeting with the actor, Neil Jane. So we had a nice dinner, and Lorraine and Neil really had a lot of chemistry, and they got along great. And then, well... <laughs> So before Lorraine and her manager arrived, we were there with Neil Jane, and he was looking at the menu, and he was like, oh, corn on the cob. I love corn on the cob. And admittingly, I was like, well, Neil, that's going to be really messy. Just like, be careful. And he's like, I don't care. I don't care. And so Lorraine arrives, and she looks at the menu, and she's like, oh, they have corn on the cob. And I'm like, OK, this is oh, meant perfect for So of course, they both ordered corn on the cob. and had a wonderful time together. And that was the first time that it was like this. Yeah. And then um, with uh, Brian Dennehy, the late Brian Dennehy, we just, you know, wrote a role for him and reached out to his reps and eventually got to him and he wanted a phone call, which was very memorable and, and great. And he responded to the material and playing himself, which a lot of actors sometimes don't want to have anything to do to play themselves. Um, and then same thing, we reached out to Keenan Thompson's reps, yeah. uh, the material got to him, he responded and wanted a phone call. And what I loved about him is he didn't play any games. By the end of the phone call, he said yes. And sometimes <laughs> you, you just have to wait, you're in limbo, you don't know if they're going to accept it. Um, and then the fifth actor was Chris Henry Coffey. Um, we've been a fan of his work um, and just offered him the role and he said yes. So that's how we made up the cast. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's a towering short of performances, like absolutely killing it. Um, Keenan's bit at the end is a riot. Actually, the funny thing about that is that I, I, I don't know if it was in the same session or if it was literally in the next session, but we actually got another short and that one had Kel Mitchell in it. Oh. We were like, wow, we should just put both of these shorts. <laughs> Spoiler, we did not book the short with Kel Mitchell. <laughs> Sorry, dude, if you're out there watching this randomly. 
um, on there. But uh, uh, for our audience, if you guys have not had a chance to see Fortune House, um, I don't know if it's out there. Maybe they can speak to that for a second. But it's a beautiful film. Um, and again, kind of like an amazing moment where just like two people connect in the most unexpected way. Here. Love, I love Fortune House. It's probably one of my favorite shorts that year, like top five best things I thought we programmed. So, but you heard all that like years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, I mean, you did. You really covered a lot of this ground. I know. I spoke right? way too much. No, I, that's, it's okay. That's the problem with going first, I didn't know what to say. I, I, I said too much. You're totally great. So I'm gonna let you sit, take anything you want to say at all. Like, what is something that no one ever asks you when they ask you a Q and A? Well, I mean. Like, you ever ask me that? Well, the thing is, is that I've only actually been to one film festival with it, and then a couple days later, the pandemic hit. Yeah. So I I brought it to Sedona Film Festival and did one Q and A, and then and then that was it. Everything else has been virtual. So I haven't really been asked a whole lot. Um, well, I ask yeah. you about casting at least on it because you're using Jason yeah. Ritter and we love Jason. We've played so much stuff that Jason's been in over the years. Yeah. I swear it's almost a joke at this point. Um, and I think the last thing we played was Ginger Gonzaga's short. Um, yeah, I love that short. That's so good. Short. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. So Jason, Jason's a friend, but I'm also just a major fan of, of his work. I think that he's such a beautiful actor and has a way of bringing so much humanity and empathy and, and compassion to everything that he does. I just, I, I like play right into his hand with, with everything. Um, I think he's, he's just the loveliest and as a human being and as an actor. So when I wrote it, I kind of, I sent it over to him um, kind of nervously because I'd never written anything before and I do not purport to be a writer at all. Um, he, he made it, you know, much, much better than, than it was on the paper for sure. Um, and he responded right away that he loved it and made him cry and that he was in. So that was great. Um, and then I wrote it also with uh, the little girl in mind, uh, Ruby Siegel. And I have babysat Ruby Siegel. Um, I, I babysat her when she was only five months old. So I've known her her whole life. And um, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was like, I need a job. I need a way, a way to make money. So I was babysitting her and I would take her out and we would go to the park and people would be like, oh my gosh, she looks exactly like you. And I was just like, thank you so much. So we kind of always <laughs> joked that, that she was, that she was my daughter. Um, and her mom would even say, she looks more like you than she does me, um, which is not true. She looks exactly like her real mom. Um, but I just have a great relationship with her and love her. And she's been really interested in acting and taking, you know, doing a children's theater program here in LA. And, um, and so I just, I asked her to do it and had her come over to the house one day before we started shooting just to kind of, you know, play it out and rehearse a little bit. And she just was so great and really natural. And I think, you know, our relationship made her feel really at ease. Um, and we had a really pared down uh, crew. It was, yeah. it was just, just a handful of people. We shot it in our house in one day. Um, I really, you know, it was, it was an experiment to, uh, more than anything. Um, I didn't, you know, I knew I wanted to try directing, but I wanted to do it in in as I guess low risk possibility yeah. as you know low risk way as possible. Um, so I you know tried to make it something that would be just a couple of characters, one location could be done in one day. Um, called in every favor, got the camera donated, you know, loaned to us for free through our producers at Paxeros Creative. And um, and everybody was just really sweet and kind of worked for free. And I made chili for everybody. And we just kind of had a, a really nice day making the film. That's yeah, that's, that's great. It. You actually make a lot of really good points in there. Um, it's something we talk to, especially a lot about film school students, a lot of which, you know, watch these kind of Q&As. Um, Orlando's got a lot of film schools in it. Um, about trying to do that, about really looking at the environment and what you're comfortable creating and right. you know dealing with this you know do i have any money at all to make this film so if i have no money to make this film but i have this location and i 
only say, and this really happens, especially outside of Los Angeles and in Orlando, is like, do I have anybody I know that can act at all? Like, right. um, you know, especially imagining if you live in a really, really small town that doesn't even have community theater, you know, and you're casting your friends in it. So how do you play to those strengths? Can you pare this down to have as minimal people as possible in a very specific time frame? And then can you do this like in the course of a weekend when everybody doesn't have to go to their actual day job? And totally. Off? And this short's going to be one of those films that I'll show people for years. Um, that is an example of how to do something extraordinarily simple in an extremely well, it's done extremely well. Thank um, you. There's been a great succession of films over the years that I've pulled out for these little moments and said, like, you could do this. But, right. You know, you might not be able to do it this well, but you can <laughs> yeah. do this. Like, this is yeah. not unachievable. So. Well, you know, my the, I came up in film. My first, very first film job was Baghead with the Duplass brothers. Oh, yeah. And I just had the tiniest little role in that but you know i remember you know flying to austin texas and getting to set and you know my now husband ross partridge would, was one of the leads of that film and he would be climbing up a tree and drilling a baby plate and putting up a light lighting his own scene and climbing down and then acting out the scene and then you know and like wrapping up the wires at the end and we all cooked for each other and and so that was kind of my introduction to filmmaking was how do we all how do we do a lot with with little so that's that was kind of those are the movies that i that i'm already kind of used to working on um so so it was kind of easy to pull together the people who were already used to working that way yeah there's a funny story about baghead um the I and actually talked to Mark about this the last time he came to the Florida Film Festival a couple of years ago is that somewhere in my DVD closet, which is a mess, is this burned DVD and a little yellow wrapper all beat up with baghead scribbled across the front of it. And Mark gave me that in Austin that year at South by because I couldn't go to the screening. And I said, Do you have a copy of the movie? And he like pulled out this crumpled up piece of paper, you know, paper package, and he's like, Yeah, man, here's one. And so I still have that in my closet somewhere. My only copy of Bag awesome. the burned DVD he was walking around with it in Austin that day. Um, That's so we cool. Laughed, we laughed about that the last time we saw each other. But so this is the part I kind of want to open up to you guys. And if you guys want to ask each other any questions about the, your own films um, that you saw. Um, so I've never done this in an actual live Q&A setting, but this seemed like the perfect kind of opportunity to, since we're always on a, such a tight schedule in a theater um, to let you guys ask each other something. So um, anybody wanna go first or have anything they wanna say? Just I have two questions. So for Jennifer, I would love to know um, just, yeah, like how you dealt with the younger actress and how much you told her about what was happening. Cause I thought, her performance yeah. was awesome and I'd love to know about that. And then Nicole, I'd love to hear more about the shooting and the drone stuff was like so emotionally motivated and I just haven't seen that before with drone stuff. It's normally like car commercials. So I'd love <laughs> to hear more about that. So working with Ruby, I mean, I touched a little bit upon, you know, I had I already have like a, you know, a good relationship with her. So it was really easy to, to work with her. And, and I think the rehearsal beforehand really helped a lot. Um, and then we just tried to keep it as conversational as possible. And I would let her kind of veer away. I told her that, you know, if she wanted to try anything different or, you know, say anything a little bit different, that was totally okay. Um, and then as far as the subject material, I gave her, I gave her parents the whole script and then she got the pages that she was in. But then I did explain to her, um, I think it was like on the actual day that we were shooting um, and we were pretty close to being done. She, she was asking about, you know, like what the, what the whole movie was about. And I did tell her that her character was actually not real anymore, that, that it was just imaginary and that I was just imagining that she was there, but I imagined her so clearly and so realistically that I wanted her to feel like she was real. Um, so she had that sensibility of it. Um, and then her parents did like have her watch the whole film because she really wanted to. And, um, and she's, I mean, she's so cool. She's such a cool kid. Um, and she really just was like, 
that was so sad. I can't, you know, I just, you know, she really kind of got it. Yeah. She really understood. Um, so, so it was kind of like doled out in, in bits and pieces to her throughout it, but she didn't know what the, the whole film was about until after, after it was all done. Um, I, okay, so basically the, the, the biggest challenge for me was creating a visual language that felt different enough for both Jay and, and Maya. And Jay, I wanted to shoot really um, <laughs> clean and uh, on sticks and like very steady unless he was in Maya's point of view, unless he was in the mosquito's point of view. And so it was a lot of camera tests, but I knew I wanted the drone shots for like cinematic value, obviously, but also to get into her point of view immediately. So you kind of get to see her like very sprawling experience in LA, but it, I mean, it was, I had, the drone guys didn't feel very comfortable with what I asked for, which was to give the drone that sort of lyrical quality of the yeah. swaying and, and kind of not moving on an axis, which I think is what they're typically used to. Yeah. So I just asked them to kind of like have fun. And then I would choose the shots that kind of felt comfortable. And I basically, drew them a map in Hollywood and asked them like, I need to get to this point, to this location. So if you could find ways to sort of fly into that street. And they, they ended up giving me so much fun stuff to work with around that location. But it was a lot of like the deep, my DP and I like figuring out how to also marry his handheld gimbal shots with those drone shots yeah. to make it all feel um, uh, the same and unified. And it was really like, once she meets him, you, like, I just wanted her point of view to be so energized by like her love and her lust and that's the thing that's really propelling the movie. And so using the drone shots really helped that feeling of the chase, I guess. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have questions for uh, anyone else? Yeah. I'd love to know how long each person's shoot was. I know, Jen, you said it was one day, but for everyone else. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's start with Alex. Alex, how long did you take to shoot? Um, I think like five days. Uh, it was, uh, you've got a lot of locations. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That was the other thing. Squirrel was so easy. It was so fast. This one just, yeah, it was, I mean, it was just, it wasn't crazy big. It was just, yeah, it was just a lot of scheduling. I mean, almost everyone just worked for free. It was just all favors. Uh, and it was just, uh, Hey, can I shoot in your apartment? Thank you so much. Uh, kind of that over and over again. <laughs> I think I, what did I, I had to rent something. Oh yeah, I had to rent like a, like a hospital looking room. It wasn't so bad, we were in that. Uh, shoot went easy, actors are perfect. Directing's easy, you just say action. If you cast them good, and they nail it, it's, it's, it's tight. <laughs> uh, Nicole, how long did you guys shoot for? We shot, um... We did a half day with real mosquitoes, and then we had five production days. Do you have to rent real mosquitoes? I use this incredible, incredible man named Stephen Kutcher, who uh, his company is called Bugs Are My Business, and he did the mosquitoes in Jurassic Park, which was like <laughs> my absolute selling point. Wow. His he did the spiders in arachnophobia i mean oh, wow. he is yeah. the guy if you want to work with insects so i mean you go to his house and he has like 13 pet tarantulas like it was wild so he caught about 20 crane flies the day before we shot yeah. and he puts he 
kept them in the fridge, which makes them lethargic. And then we shot them on a white cardboard. And it was just like, you know, we, we got the angles and we got the two shot of them walking towards one another. And it was like, it, it worked out so well. I can't even believe it, but we shot on like, you know, these crazy macro lenses and, um, Stephen was there to sort of be the insect handler. <laughs> and I didn't ask that, but it was five and a half days. Okay. <laughs> Man, I don't know how anybody's going to top that. Jesse, how long did you shoot? <laughs> <laughs> um, my insect handler. Um, <laughs> we shot in one day and we did a pickup for the flashback scene, but that's what it's about when you don't have any money. Mm. One day. And when we got it, barely. That's why it was so quick to edit it. I had like one useful take each time. It was oh, a blessing and a curse. Well, Juliana, you should answer that question for everybody else. How long did you guys spend on it? Um, we shot four days um, in the Black Box Theater and then one additional day at, um, I guess we're revealing, the, at the courthouse. Okay. So five days. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Um, Matthew, do you have any, any questions you want to jump in on? Well, uh, yeah, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, all these films are incredibly tightly scripted and work so well because they're so well written. Um, and uh, I'm just curious if some of them obviously have twist endings, like really twist endings that come out of left field. And I'm wondering when you guys start the project or you know, start shooting the project, do you know, do you start with the ending or you start with the beginning or an overall concept? Like, when did you come to realize that, oh, this film has to end right here. We have to do it this way. Uh, whoever wants to take at it, go for it. I can start with that quickly. Um, I real, you know, someone recently asked me, would you consider Thirsty a hap, hap does that have a happy ending to you? <laughs> and, and oh man! Okay. I said, yes. I said yes because they end up together, and True. and Mosquito gets to hear him say "I love you." Yeah. And so they find each other at the end, and even though they died, I do think it does have an optimistic ending because mosquitoes are not long for this for this journey and the life. And so I knew. I remember. I realized they had to die together yes. because it's sort of it's what happens to bugs in the realistic sense because everything else is so far fetched. Yeah. No, I mean the ending of Thirsty is definitely a moment. Like yeah. it's like it is the perfect moment in the film. Like it is the sort of like idea that now they found each other, the end, but like literally. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, well, I guess uh, let's. Uh, Anybody else? Jen, you, I mean, you, Jen and, and, and Matthew Jelani, you kinds of, you both essentially have the twist standing. Yeah, I, you know, I've I've been to so many film festivals with with projects that I've been in, and I go to all the different shorts programs, and a lot of times my favorite short films are the ones that kind of have like a very like clear, clear arc and then a quick, a quick, you know, drastic twist at the end. Yeah. Um, and so I, I did kind of approach the script in that way where it was starting with the, the, the twist ending and then kind of reverse engineering it backwards. Yeah. Um, and I think Jesse was saying that she did not like to watch trauma and I, I, although that's changed since I've gotten pregnant and become a mom now, I also do not like to watch trauma, but before, like, bring me all the trauma. Oh, I just trauma. want to watch it and revel in it. I want to cry. I want to feel all the feelings. And, um, and so, you know, perhaps I was, I was extra indulgent in, in that, but I, I just kind of wanted to like lean, lean in a little bit to, to that experience, you know, like having the beginning of it be almost you know, idyllic, that, that it's this, this very idyllic relationship between a mother and a daughter and the way that they communicate so openly and beautifully and the kid, there's no temper tantrums or anything like that. Um, 
and then and then moving into why it's so idyllic is because it's it's not actually real in any I mean, way. The, the thing about Baby Kate, the thing that makes this short work for me, and I'm imagining for the audiences, is because everything that your character experiences emotionally throughout the entire short is fully explained by what we consider to be a twist ending. Right. Short, but it is not knowing the ending. There's no false note that like would make that ending not seem the exact way it was going to always go down. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, I just, I wanted to make it clear without over explaining it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I actually cut a lot. Like it was, it was totally overwritten. And then in the editing process is where I did most of the, the writing editing where I was like, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. I'm over explaining. I'm, t I'm yeah. you know, just, I'm telling too much and, and so much like we have to give audiences more credit for than than yeah. you know over over explaining every little step of the way. So it was it kind of became a test of okay, who has not, not read the script or seen a previous cut that can tell me if this if this still works without you know explicitly saying everything. Um, Matthew Janana, kind of the same thing. I mean, your ending is obviously it's not a it's not a left field ending. Um, you know, it, it's all everything that he is doing can be explained by what is going to occur in the final scene. Um, but I guess the question is, did you come to the script from knowing that, you know, I mean, obviously you knew how it was going to end, but you know, how did, did you reverse engineer to that a little bit? Did you build it backwards? You do it. I mean, it, it was tricky the writing, writing yeah. and then also then the directing, but the writing of it, yeah, the writing of it. Yeah, we knew we knew what the twist would be, and obviously, when you write a twist, you're you're kind of holding your breath all the way up until you play in front of a large audience and you see if they're surprised or not. Because the whole time you're editing the script and then the film, and you know the twist, so you're kind of holding your breath the whole time and testing it on people who don't know the script and being like, "Were you surprised or not?" Um, but the writing of it. Yeah, I would say we wrote it knowing what the twist was going to be and, and hoping that if once you've seen it, if you watched it again, that you'd see other things that yeah, were maybe like clues. Um, so yeah, that was all in there. Good. And then the directing of it, you know, you just have to make sure that the actor's not tipping yeah. your hand. Right. And it's so tricky because you want them to live in the truth of the moment. Essentially, he is lying and he's not an actor. Um, but also you hope that the audience forgets and just thinks, oh, he's a very bad actor and I feel bad for him <laughs> because he's being tortured by this contemporary Stella Adler teacher here. Yeah. Um, so we would do um, test screenings once we, you know, to family and close friends and people that we trusted to see when they could predict or if something was tipping the hand. And a lot of it was in the area where we wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, so we felt like, okay, you know, we'll stick with that. Awesome. I liked with your film, when it cuts to the courtroom scene, there's still a part of, where at least for me, where I was like, I oh, he must have booked it. He booked yeah. the yeah, film. And I was like waiting for it to like pull out and to show the cameras or for the, the director to yell cut or something. And when that didn't happen, I was like, oh shoot, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, I think that's a very, um kind of good it's a good note because i think we all kind of did the same thing when we originally saw it which is that we assumed he booked the he booked the role good. Um, good. and then we realized it's a real courtroom and then we know yeah. we know we know it's not going to go well <laughs> um guys i would love to keep you on here forever talking about everything but i know everybody kind of has to get back to their real lives so uh if i could just like if you guys no i don't i don't have anything <laughs> good. um if you have any last minute something you want to say, um, this is really kind of give you a shot to do it and then we'll wrap up. And, and, and I thank you guys so much for, for coming on here and joining us for this. Absolutely. Um, well, Tim, Matthew, we just want to thank you for, for having us. Um, and uh, to all of you, it's, we're so grateful to be in great company yeah, of such, such so talented great. filmmakers and, and best of luck with your careers. And we're going to be fans. Hopefully we'll see you very Again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what they said. And yeah. thank, you guys, thank you guys for sh supporting shorts, you know. It's yes. awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Honored to be here.
virtually. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be able to invite you guys back someday with another film in actual person. Um, Absolutely. Or, or Alex, the one year he was finally coming, you know. <laughs> It was perfectly timed. You had Florida right here. You had Calgary right there. I was going to save one plane ticket. Oh, yeah. well, I'm the real victim of Corona, actually. I, oh. man, I feel you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> anyway, um, to the audience out there that's been watching this, thank you guys so much. If you haven't had a chance to see these shorts, get somehow found that you needed to watch the Q&A first. They are still totally available online and promise you aren't totally spoiled by this. Um, if you have uh, got some friends that you think would love these things, they're on the virtual platform until the 20th. And uh, we really thank you guys so much for joining us here. And we wish you all well. And uh, thank all these filmmakers. And uh, we look forward to seeing all their films that are coming in the future. So thank you. Thanks, guys.